Hi, I'm Danny with Tax29 Tax Service. And I'm Andy. You know, Danny, the prices of everything keeps going up and up. Inflation. Well, at Tax29, we said enough. We're keeping our pricing structure the same this year as what we had last tax season. So whether you file in one of our local offices or whether you file with us online at tax29.com, you'll get the same professional tax prep at affordable pricing along with year-round service. For a list of our pricing or to find out more, stop by one of our local offices or visit us at tax29.com. What's the real story? How did all of this come to be? Was it all by chance or did something or someone design everything? Join us as we learn from our host, William Henry, and discover that the story of the Earth and our universe is really his story. Welcome to Discovering His Story, a program produced by Youngstown Christian Television. In this program, we seek to integrate the biblical record with the historical record and uh, learn some things about the Bible and about history as well. We are in the era of time that we're calling ancient times. And within that era, we've been looking at the time of the land of Canaan or the promised land when the Israelites came into the land following the exodus from Egypt and uh, during which time uh, also we have come into the kingdom period of Israel. Uh, we looked last time at the uh, the first kings of Israel. Do you remember who the first king of Israel was? That's right, Saul. And he was followed by David. And then David's son took over, whose name was? All right, Solomon. Very good. Now, something happens, however, at the end of Solomon's reign, which we want to talk about today. <clears throat> Following the death of Solomon his son Rehoboam became king. The people petitioned him to reduce the heavy tax load that had been instituted by his father Solomon. Consultation with the elders brought a similar opinion. But Rehoboam's friends counseled a stern increase in taxes instead. So Rehoboam got his buddies together and said, what do you guys think I ought to do? And their counsel was, I don't know, I think you need to show them who's boss. Besides, we like all that money coming in. It makes for better parties. So you need to increase taxes. Show them who's in charge. And so that's what he did. This caused a rebellion against Rehoboam by Solomon's former advisor, Jeroboam. Uh, Jeroboam then led the 10 northern tribes away from the southern two to form the nation of Israel with its capital in Samaria. The southern nation of Judah, along with the tribe of Benjamin, continued following the line of David. So we have the northern kingdom under King Jeroboam, capital in Samaria, and that's called Israel. The southern kingdom with King Rehoboam, capital in Jerusalem, and that kingdom is called Judah. And all the kings of Judah descended from King David. Now, you might start to get confused at this point. So let me see if I can help you out to keep these straight. If we go by the alphabetic principle of looking at, at uh, the order of letters in the alphabet, uh, we have Israel starts with I, and that's on top. And then Judah starts with J, and that's on the bottom. So you have I, J. All right, then you've got two kings whose names are very similar, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. So you've got Jeroboam, starts with J, that's on top, and that comes before R, Rehoboam, who is on the bottom in Judah. So you see how, how easy that is to keep those straight. Now, <clears throat> uh, the problem is uh, when we look at the capitals, it's reversed. <laughs> so Samaria is the capital of Israel, and unfortunately, in the alphabet, that comes after J for Jerusalem in the southern kingdom of Judah. But I tried. We got two out of three that fit. And so hopefully that'll, <clears throat> that'll help you out a little bit. 
Um, when uh, Jeroboam set up the kingdom of Israel, he also set up rival altars to that in uh, uh, Jerusalem. Let's see if that's where I want. Um, oh, let's do this first. Uh, let's look at the uh, characteristics of the kingdoms, then we'll talk about uh, Jeroboam specifically. Uh, so Israel and Judah. Um, Israel is larger, 10 tribes, verses 2, uh, and wealthier. Uh, Judah is smaller and more poor. Israel has a mixed population, ethnically and therefore religiously. So there, there are more non-Israelite people living in Israel uh, than in Judah. In Israel, they're more exposed to outside forces, uh, the nations that are around them. Uh, Judah is more isolated from outside forces. And, and this is primarily because Judah on the east side has the Dead Sea. To the south, there's desert. And then the Philistine states uh, to the east, whereas Israel uh, has a lot of nations surrounding it. Uh, Israel experiences spiritual and political instability. And part of that is because, at least the political instability, is because uh, there's not one dynasty, there's not one family that's ruling in Israel. Uh, whereas in Judah, there is a stable dynastic tradition because all the kings come from the line of David. Israel enjoyed advantages of trade and commerce from its coastal route. See, it's right on the coast of the Mediterranean. And uh, the advantage for Judah was that they have Jerusalem and the temple complex. Okay, now let's go to Jeroboam I, who set up the kingdom of Israel. And when he did so, he set up uh, altars in the cities of Dan and Bethel. Uh, why did he do that? Well, he could not conceive of people going to Jerusalem to worship while still retaining his kingdom. So how is he going to keep people satisfied with being in his kingdom of Israel when they're constantly going down Jerusalem in Judah uh, in order to uh, worship? So he decided he needed some places more local uh, in order for people to be able to exercise their religion uh, without going outside of the country. Uh, so Jeroboam, uh, of course, was uh, being disobedient to God in setting up these altars. Um, and uh, we talked about why he did it uh, and his fear. Um, so next we have this list of his sins. Um, did he take his fears to God in prayer, perhaps even ask for a sign? No. Instead, he reformed, no, deformed the ordinances for worship that the Lord had given to Israel through Moses. In fact, they, they even had to change things in the Torah to make it match uh, Israel as being the place where God intended them to worship, that is, at, at, at Dan and at Bethel. Um, so uh, Jer Jeroboam erected uh, new shrines in the south and the north. Makes it convenient. He placed golden calves in those shrines. All right, so two golden calves this time instead of just one. He established new festivals that he had devised from his own heart, we're told. Uh, shrines on high places and a new priesthood in place of the Levitical priests. He did not subscribe to the regulative principle of worship, that is, of doing things the way God said to be, they were to be done. He trampled God's holy ordinances for worship underfoot. <clears throat> in Jeroboam's obvious sins of idolatry and overthrowing God's ordinances for worship, there is embodied another great evil. King Jeroboam presumed in wicked pride to subordinate the worship of God to the interests of the state. He made the church a tool of the state. And uh, we, can, we can find example there and a principle there that we can carry on through the rest of history. And that is that any time <clears throat> the, the worship of God or the church becomes a tool of the state, they are working against God. There's no doubt about that. Well, Jeroboam uh, found, found a, a messenger that uh, carried something to him that he needed to hear. Uh, he was offering a sacrifice 
for the idol of the golden calf. And uh, while he was engaged in offering incense, a prophet from Judah appeared before him with a warning message from Yahweh. And attempting to arrest the prophet, he raised his hand and pointed at him, and it was dried up. And the altar before which he stood was torn apart. So, uh, here's the, the be bad beginning of the nation of Israel. <clears throat> well, it's not going to get any better. Uh, let's look at the new two nations and compare them and their kings. If we look at the nation of Judah, uh, starting with Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, and we go down through the kings, we see that besides some kings there's an E, and besides some kings there's a G. What do you think that stands for? Well, if you said E is evil and G is good, you would have been right on the money. So look down through these kings. You've heard of some of these, uh, and most maybe you haven't, but uh, what pattern do you notice? Yeah, a couple of evil kings, then a couple of good kings, and then some more evil kings, and then a, a good king who becomes the evil king, and then, and then three good kings in a row, an evil king, and then good, a couple evil, and a good, and then... The last four are all evil kings. So we have a mixture in Judah. Now, the one thing that's constant is that they are all descendants of David. Now, do you think we'll find the same thing in the northern kingdom of Israel? Let's take a look. We look at the kings of Israel, and uh, we don't see any G's or E's. We look down through there, we see Jeroboam, uh, Jehu, uh, Hoshea, huh, wonder, wonder why there aren't any letters. Oh, because they were all evil. There's no point in putting an E there. Just put one big E over the whole bunch. Every one of them was evil. Every one of them was disobedient to God and worshipped idols. <clears throat> so there's a huge difference between the two. And uh, a reason why the northern kingdom of Israel was judged uh, by God before the southern kingdom of Judah. All right, so uh, Jeroboam constructed these bull gods, set up a festival, attempted to change the calendar, set up non-Levitical priests, and that kind of set the standard then for the rest of the kings. Um, eventually, Judah's kings, even though they were good and evil, had so many evil ones in a row that uh, eventually they fell into judgment due to their idolatry. Uh, the northern kingdom, as we said, had only bad kings and was judged by God first. All right, let's consider now a, an out, a nation outside of Israel and their relationship to what is happening and what is transpiring in Israel, and that is Egypt. Egypt's so close. There's always something going on with Egypt. And uh, we have the man Shishak uh, that we've mentioned before, who invaded Israel. And when he did so, he was able to force Rehoboam to yield enormous tribute. In 1 Kings 14, 25 to 26, it says this, In the fifth year of Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem. He carried off the treasures of the temple of Yahweh and the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made. But he did not destroy Jerusalem. Uh, 2 Chronicles 12, 2 and 3 add more details, saying this, With 1,200 chariots and 60,000 horsemen and the innumerable troops of Libyans, remember, Shishak was originally from Libya, uh, Sukkites, who are mercenary Libyan soldiers, and Cushites, who are from Upper Egypt, uh, the land of Cush, present-day Ethiopia. They came with him from Egypt. He captured the fortified cities of Judah and came as far as Jerusalem. Uh, there were inscriptions, or there are inscriptions of this, on the wall of the Temple of Ammon, which is pictured on the bottom of the slide. This is in Karnak, uh, and that inscription is of this particular victory by Shishak, and you can see on the map where exactly he traveled. 
<clears throat> so let's look at the uh, divided monarchy history. So from 931 to 885 BC, we're going to see 50 years of fighting between Israel and Judah. And we're not going to cover all the details of these things. You can find it in the Bible. Uh, from 885 to 835 BC, there were 50 years of the Omrides. That's the House of Omri. We are going to talk about that a little bit. And alliances. From 841 to 753 BC is the century of the Jehu dynasty. And then from 753 to 722 BC, we finally come to the fall of Samaria, the capital, and Assyrian captivity. So that is what's going to be happening uh, in Israel, the northern kingdom. Uh, here's a chart that may be a little bit difficult for you to see. If you get real close, you might be able to make out uh, the names here. Looking at uh, the kingdoms uh, divided, first on the left, you see all the, the kings that are listed there. And um, in this list, we have an extra one on the uh, Israel side, making 20 apiece. Uh, so there are 44 kings altogether. And then on the right-hand side, we see the prophets. On the right-hand side of the chart, there we are. We see the prophets before Israel's captivity. And by the way, some of these prophets wrote stuff and some of them didn't. Some of them are just included in the narratives. But it's important to know when a prophet uh, was around in order to understand fully his prophecies, especially if they're written. So the prophets before Israel's captivity include Elijah, Elisha, Jonah, Joel, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, and Micah. Now, after Israel's captivity, which we'll be talking about later, by Assyria, uh, then we have the prophets Nahum, uh, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, and Jeremiah. And then sometime later, we're going to see that Judah is taken into captivity by Babylon. <clears throat> and after that event, uh, we have the prophets Daniel, Ezekiel, Obadiah, Ezra, Zechariah, Haggai, Esther, Nehemiah, and Malachi. Now, the person who put this chart together uh, continues into what we call the New Testament, but it's really Old Testament times, to include John the Baptist. And if he does that, we have 44 kings and 22 prophets. And um, as uh, at the very end of it all, uh, of Judah, we have uh, Jesus Christ, who is as king of Israel and Judah, uh, after the 44 kings on both sides. So, an interesting chart, anyway, I thought, and it kind of brings together a lot of the things that uh, in, uh, are a part of the history of the divided monarchy. Well, let, let's center in on just some of the kings from the, the beginning in Israel. The first king of the northern kingdom of Israel was Jeroboam. And after him, we have Nadab, and then Baasha, and then Elah, and then Zimri, and then Omri. <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about Omri. Uh, for some time, the town of Gibbethon, which is indicated on the map, a city occupied by Levites and on the border with Philistia, was a sore spot. At the end of the reign of Elah, the son of Baasha, news of the revolt of Zimri reached the Israelite troops encamped there. They elected Omri as their commander, went to Tirzah, the capital of Israel, and besieged and conquered it. Zimri, who saw that the end was near, set fire to the royal palace and burned it down upon himself, perishing in the blaze. That's in 1 Kings 16. After a period of civil war, Omri was able to secure the kingdom for his, himself. Remember that there is no line of succession in Israel. So oftentimes the king of Israel is simply a commander who either kills the king or takes over after the death of a king. Uh, Omri is one who stabilized the kingdom and strengthened it against the threat from Aram or Syria. He's the one, in fact, who built the city of Samaria at a strategic location and moved the capital there. I told you previously that Samaria was the capital of Israel. I should have mentioned that that was something that occurred later. It becomes the capital of Israel 
uh, under Omri. Uh, so uh, Omri is mentioned in numerous ancient Near Eastern inscriptions. That's why we're looking at him. The most extensive of these is the famous Mesha Steli or Moabite stone in which the Moabite king Mesha describes his accomplishments. In it, he describes how Omri had expanded the kingdom of Israel and subjugated Moab before he had thrown off Israel's oppression. Omri is also mentioned on the black obelisk of, oops, sorry, there's, I was a little behind there. There's the uh, Moabite stone. I'll give you a moment to look at that and what is written on it. And then next is the black obelisk of Shalmaneser III, emperor of Assyria. Uh, this inscription details how Jehu, king of Israel, brought tribute to Shalmaneser. The accompanying relief shows, uh, appears to show Jehu bowing before Shalmaneser. In the inscription, Jehu is called son of Omri which in this case means he was the successor of, uh, to the Omride dynasty, not necessarily a son in the literal sense. Uh, Omri renewed a treaty with Tyre, remember the city of Tyre over on the coast, by marrying his son Ahab to the Phoenician princess Jezebel. That should ring a bell, no pun intended. Relations with Judah were improved for a time through the marriage of Athaliah, to Jehoram. So Omri is making connections through marriage and establishing treaties uh, with Tyre and with Judah. Uh, finally, even a hundred years after Omri's dynasty came to an end, the territory of Israel was still referred to as Omri land in Assyrian inscriptions. In around 732 BC, Tiglath-Pileser III who was then emperor of Assyria, invaded Israel and took many captives. In his analytic records, he boasted, Israel, literally Omri land, all its and their possessions I led to Assyria. Over a decade later, Sargon II described how he defeated Israel and took its citizens into captivity. He says, I conquered and sacked the towns Shinuhtu, and Samaria, and all Omri land. Although, successfully, although successful politically, uh, Omri was a spiritual disaster, as you might expect, doing more evil than any king before him. That brings us to Ahab of Israel, who married Jezebel of Sidon, who brought her Baal worship with her into Israel. In various archaeological expeditions in Palestine, a great deal of evidence in the form of seals and inscriptions on pottery fragments has turned up that the name Baal appears in the personal names of the people who lived in the northern kingdom. The fact that Jewish parents were naming their children after false gods shows what a great impact the Baal worship introduced by Jezebel had upon the land of Israel. This is when the prophet Elijah conducts his contest with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. I'm sure you remember that. This was an attack on the god Baal. Baal was the one who controlled fire, and yet Yahweh sent fire from heaven. Baal didn't. Yahweh brought drought and then rain at the word of Elijah. Baal was called the cloud rider and was the god of fertility. Previously, Yahweh had provided for Elijah and the widow of Zarephath, remember, by making the oil and meal continue. Baal was known as the son of El, the god of grain. Yahweh had raised a child from the dead through Elijah. In the Keret, that's K-E-R-E-T epic, Baal will come to give children. And then the 
later ascension of Elijah, when Elijah was taken up to heaven, is similar to Baal ascending to ride the clouds. Just as a side note, what was it that carried Elijah to heaven? If you said a chariot of fire, check your text again. I'll leave it at that. All right, so following Ahab, we continue on with the other kings in the northern kingdom. Uh, you can find Omri there, number six, Ahab number seven. Now we go to the next king, Ahaziah. Ahaziah's uh, idolatry. He is the son of Ahab, uh, although there's also a king named Ahaziah in Judah, so it's hard to not hard to get them mixed up. Uh, but Ah this Ahaziah ruled Israel from 853 to 852 BC. He continued the wicked practices of his parents by worshiping Baal. When he became ill, he sent messengers into Philistine territory to get help from their god at Ekron and to ask whether he would recover from his disease. The messengers were met by Elijah, who asked why they were going to Ekron when there was a god in Israel. He told them that the king was not going to recover from his illness, and Ahaz Ahaziah indeed did die and was succeeded by his brother Jehoram, another son of Ahab. And you see Jehoram, um, Jeho oh, Je Jehoram, yeah, mentioned, oh, is shown there besides Ahaziah. Uh, and the names that are checked there are names that do appear in the archaeological record, of course, which fits in exactly what we find in the Bible. Well, the relations between Judah and Israel are off and on. Uh, sometimes they're fighting, sometimes they're, they have a treaty. Uh, spiritually, uh, Jehoshaphat began his reign in a positive way. Uh, in 2 Chronicles 17, it says this about him, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of his father David before him. He did not consult the Baals, but sought the God of his father and followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. The Lord established the kingdom under his control, and all Judah brought gifts to Jehoshaphat so that he had great wealth and honor. Uh, his heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord. And we see here, he had good communication with the kingdoms around. He removed the high places. He sent his leaders to different cities to teach the people the rules of the kingdom. He sent the Levites to teach the people the religious rites, rituals, and hymns. He sent the priests to teach the people the book of the law and how to worship God. He was a good king, but he reigned in the fear of God, and he reigned in the fear of God, and he had many blessings. Probably the greatest trial to come upon Jehoshaphat was in the form of three nations which attacked Judah, Ammon, Edom, and Moab. But in the midst of all this, Jehoshaphat trusted in Yahweh. As he was told, the battle is not yours, but God's. During this period, King Jehoshaphat, the fourth king of Judah, introduced a period of close relationships between Israel and Judah by marriages between the royal families, by adopting the same names for their children, and by frequent visits with each other. They made joint ventures in foreign trade, establishing a merchant navy, and uh, at various times they joined military forces in putting down the rebellion of the Moabites. But these alliances were an entanglement to Judah because the kings of Israel were so idolatrous. Judah's spiritual progress was undermined. Elisha preached against this alliance. And, still, and so this influence of Israel upon Judah was detrimental, finally leading to pagan practices. But before that happens, we have the demise of Israel itself, which we'll talk about next time on Discovering His Story. What's the real story? How did all of this come to be? Was it all by chance, or did something or someone design everything. Join us as we learn from our host, William Henry, 
and discover that the story of the Earth and our universe is really his story. <laughs>